Muscles convert chemical energy into mechanical energy leading to the generation of force, movement or both. This is brought about by interaction of the various uh, proteins present in the muscle fibers. So that mechanism is known as molecular basis of muscle contraction. So how do skeletal muscles contract? Well, it occurs by the mechanism of sliding filaments. That means the myofilaments which are present in the skeletal muscle fiber slide on each other. So fundamentally, the size of the filaments is the same despite the shortening of the muscle fiber being occurring. So actually, the sarcomere shortens. So if we see this figure, from here to here, from one Z line to another Z line is sarcomere. And when the muscle contracts, we see that the size of the sarcomere has decreased. So what has happened that the filaments have slid over each other. But you see that the I bands which are there, right, which are formed by actin filaments, troponin and tropomyosin, they have shortened. Then the H zone which is there where we see only thick filaments that is where there is no overlap, it is actually shortening. But the A bands, they remained constant. So A band is basically the entire thick filaments. You see that is remaining constant. So in short, Z lines are moving close to each other, right? So what causes contraction? Well, contraction is explained by sliding filament theory, which was given by Huxley and Niederger K in 1954. Further, that how these filaments are sliding is explained by cross bridge cycle. That is the ratchet theory, which was again given by Huxley in 1957. So let us see what is this. So how do filaments slide? What happens uh, that the actin filament consists of active sites, right? Which can actually bind the myosin head. So this uh, myosin head has an intrinsic inbuilt ability to bind to this active sites on the actin. However, normally when the muscle is not contracting, what happens that these active sites of uh, actin are kept covered by tropomyosin, right? So for this interaction of myosin and actin to occur so that the contraction can actually occur, that the filament can actually slide, actin filament can actually slide over the myosin filament, we want to expose this active site of actin. Now this is brought about by calcium, which in turn interacts with troponin. So, this troponin you see has three sites. One is the eye site which binds with the actin filament. The other is T site which binds with the tropomyosin. And the third one is C which binds with calcium. Now with I and T actually this troponin is holding that tropomyosin over the actin. Now when calcium comes and binds to the C site, what happens that the other two sites move, right? So they pull the tropomyosin molecule away from the actin filament, right? So this exposes the active sites of actin. But for this, obviously, we want the presence of calcium. So there should be a mechanism for the release of calcium into the sarcoplasm so that once released, it can go and bind to the troponin. Well, yes, there is an apparatus known as the sarcoplasmic triad which causes the release of the calcium. So in this, what we see that there is invagination of the plasma membrane of the muscle fiber which forms a T-tubule. And besides this T-tubule, there is sarcoplasmic reticulum which is the store of the calcium, right? So what happens that when an impulse from the exon reaches to the muscle fiber via neuromuscular junction, it leads to generation of the action potential, right? Now, this action potential actually causes a change in the voltage throughout the membrane of the muscle fiber. But this voltage change should actually reach into the muscle fiber, right? So, that is brought about by these invaginations of the muscle membrane which carry this voltage change deep into the muscle fiber, that is the cell of the muscle, right? So that voltage change is carried here and it does something 
which causes release of calcium from the stores of the calcium that is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, T tubules transmit action potential deep into the muscle fiber and L tubules which are formed by the sarcoplasmic reticulum and are acting as intracellular store for calcium. There is interaction between these T tubules and L tubules causing the release of calcium. So, this process is known as excitation contraction coupling. That means the process by which an action potential on the surface of a muscle fiber leads to the contraction of a myocyte. So, you see electrical energy is being converted into mechanical energy and in between something is happening and that something is release of the calcium ion. So, we can say that calcium is the coupler for this excitation contraction coupling. But there is an anatomical basis for this coupling. So, in short, calcium is the chemical for this excitation contraction coupling and T tubules and L tubules form the anatomical basis of this excitation contraction coupling. So, what is happening is that as the potential change travels from the sarcolemma deep into the T tubules, there is presence of certain receptors and channels here. So, on the T tubules, there is presence of dihydropyridine receptor, which in short is known as DHPR, right? Dihydropyridine receptor. These are L type calcium channels, right? So, this is voltage gated calcium channels. Then, on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, just close to this T tubule, there is presence of another receptor that is the rhinodine receptor. And again, these are calcium release channels. We are telling that calcium is present inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? So, opening of these rhinodine receptor or calcium release channels can cause a release of calcium into the sarcoplasm. Fine. Now, these DHPR and RYR actually interact with each other physically. Fine. There is like physical interaction between these two. So, when the action potential travels along this T tubule and reaches to the DHPR, the interaction between these two receptors causes the opening of this rhinodine receptors and hence release of calcium from the calcium stores that is the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. So you see this is the physical interaction which is shown here between the DHPR and RYR receptor. Now one thing to note here that uh, this uh, L tubule that is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, has a protein calsequestrin which sequesters calcium, holds calcium, right? So, a lot of calcium molecules can bind on this uh, calsequestrin and that is the reason that uh, this sarcoplasmic reticulum acts as a store for calcium, right? Because as we'll see later that we want calcium to go back inside also, fine. So, if all the calcium is present free, it will be very difficult for the body or for the sarcoplasmic reticulum to get back the calcium from the sarcoplasm into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Lot of energy will be required because the concentration inside will be too high. Fine. So, this calcium is kept sequestered by a protein known as calsequestrin. Anyways, now you see that once this calcium is released, what it will do? It will bind to the C subunit of the troponin which will pull back the tropomyosin from the active sites of actin and now the heads of the myosinthic filament can actually interact with the active sites of actin. Now when that happens the head actually moves like this and pulls the actin from both sides towards the M line thus causing the shortening of the sarcomere. So that you see this is the distance shown that how the Z line will move closer because of the pulling effect caused by the heads of the myosin molecule which form the myosin thick filament. So in short, if we see the steps of the excitation contraction coupling, how is it occurring? Action potential moves along the T tubules, right? This voltage change is sensed by the dihydropyridine receptors. Then this is communicated to the rhinodine receptor which in turn opens causing release of the calcium from sarcoplasmic reticulum. The released calcium binds with the C unit of troponin. Then you see that each molecule can bind with four calcium ions. 
This leads to moving away of the tropomyosin and thus uncovering of active sites on actin. Thus, myosin head can bind to these active sites and this binding in turn pulls the actin filaments and causes power stroke. Okay, so this power stroke, each power stroke, each bend of the myosin head can cause the movement of the actin filament approximately 10 nanometers. Okay, so that is the power stroke. And because of these power stroke, when repeatedly it occurs, it causes contraction. Okay, fine. Now, how this actually the myosin head moves and causes the power stroke is explained by walk-along theory or ratchet theory, that is the cross-bridge cycling. Now, suppose this is the actin filament and this is the myosin molecule with the head of the myosin. Fine. Now, once the active sites of the actin are exposed, at this particular position, you see myosin is bound with ADP and phosphate. So, at this particular position, it is ready to bind with the active sites of actin. So, exposure of the active site causes myosin head to bind to actin and as soon as it binds, there is a configuration change in the myosin head causing it to bend, right? So, what it binds here and then there is a tilt here causing it to bend something like this, right? So, because of this bend, there will be a pull of the myosin filament towards the other side. Fine. Now, as soon as this bend occurs, there is release of this ADP and phosphate from the myosin head and in turn, there is binding of ATP. Okay. So, you see, binding requires that ADP and phosphate should be bound to the myosin head. And once the myosin head binds, this ADP and phosphate is released and ATP comes and binds. Now, when that happens, automatically there is release of this myosin head from the active site of the actin, right? So, basically, ATP is decreasing the affinity of the head to the actin and it is causing the release of the head from the actin. So, what has happened? Tilt of myosin head causes filaments to slide. That is the power stroke has occurred. This caused release of ADP and phosphate and binding of new ATP to myosin head. And with binding, there is release of head from actin. Fine. So, we can see that the new state which is achieved is something like this. With the ATP bound to the myosin molecule. Fine. Now, once this occurs, we know that this myosin head has an intrinsic ATPase activity and it cleaves this ATP to again ADP and phosphate. So, with this cleavage, as ATP is cleaved to ADP and phosphate, myosin return back to its original position with bound ADP and phosphate and ready to bind with the exposed active site of actin again. So, what is happening? Myosin head is binding to the active site pulling it, that is the power stroke, then releasing, then again going back to its position and this is keep on being repeating, right? So, this is known as cross bridge cycling. So, that's the basis for muscle contraction. But we want the muscles to relax as well. How it should be done? Well, we need to remove the calcium from the sarcoplasm so that the active sites of actin are again covered by tropomyosin. So, that happens by a pump known as smooth endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase pump or circa pump. So, it is a pump, right? So, that means it is pumping calcium against the concentration gradient. As we said that uh, there is high concentration of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? So, as soon as the calcium is released by this rhinodyne receptor, this pump becomes active causing the movement of calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, this causes decrease in concentration of calcium in the sarcoplasm, thus releasing calcium from troponin and hence causing cessation of interaction between actin and myosin. So, myosin can no more interact with the active sites of actin and obviously the cross bridge cycling will stop. With this, let us see some applied aspects. 
So there is something known as malignant hyperthermia. So as the term indicates in this, body temperature will increase, right? So what happens that this is a channelopathy affecting rhinodine receptor. And as we said that this is a calcium release channel. So if a channelopathy affects this rhinodine receptor, there is a constant leak of the calcium which is present in sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm through this rhinodine receptor. So if calcium is continuously released into the sarcoplasm, what will happen? The cross recycling will continue and this will cause skeletal muscle rigidity, right? So muscle will be in a constant state of contraction and because of lot of ATP being used up uh, and we know that in cross recycling ATP is being used up, isn't it? This causes uh, the metabolites which are being released to accumulate that is lactic acidosis to occur. Fine. Now this malignant hyperthermia is triggered by certain anesthetics and extremely hot environment and uh, strenuous exercise if there is a mutation of rhinodine receptors. Okay. By the way, why is so much heat being generated? We are saying that calcium is being released into the sarcoplasm causing cross recycling. Fine, but we know that whenever ATP is being utilized, the utilization is only 45% efficient. That means the energy utilized is much less and 55% of the energy appears as heat. So this causes hyperthermia. Okay. Now let's consider a second aspect that is rigor mortis. Rigor mortis is a muscle rigidity which happens after death and as you might be aware that it is used to determine the time since death in forensics. But why does the muscle rigidity happens? Why is not that the muscle is going to a state of relaxation after death? Well, you see that if you have understood cross bridge cycling, you will understand that ATP is required for detachment of myosin head from actin because only when the ATP attaches to the myosin does the myosin head detach from the actin, right? Plus ATP is also required for the functioning of a smooth endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase that is circa pump. Now with death what happens that new ATP cannot form. And once ATP cannot form, that means it will not be available for detachment of myosin head from actin and for removal of calcium from the sarcoplasm. That means that this head of the myosin will be kept bound with the active site of actin and hence keep it pulled, right? So that will cause the muscle rigidity after death. However, after some time after death, there is a breakdown of all the proteins which ultimately leads to relaxation, right? But soon after death, there is rigidity of the muscles. So that is known as rigor mortis. And what is its mechanism? Non-availability of ATP. Fine. So in summary, what we saw that muscle contraction occurs by sliding filament mechanism, which is explained by cross bridge cycling or uh, ratchet theory. And calcium is required for uh, myosin head to bind uh, to the active sites of actin. And uh, this occurs because of interaction of uh, DHPR receptors with RYR receptors present on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So there is a role of sarcoplasmic triad in release of calcium. And uh, removal of calcium is required for uh, relaxation which occurs by circa pump. And uh, we also saw certain applied aspects that is the malignant hypothermia and the basis of rigor mortis.